You're listening to John MacArthur as he continues his current study titled, When Jesus Comes. Along with being the Bible teacher here on Grace to You, John is a pastor, author, and president of the Master's College and Seminary in Southern California. Now, this study is focusing on Christ's return, his second coming, an event that's so pivotal it can seem like it's the focus of the entire book of Revelation. But, uh, John, I know you'd say there's a lot more going on in this last book of the Bible. Yeah, Carl, and we're looking down a little bit at the details in Revelation 19 and 20. But I think it would be helpful to people if we could sort of pull up and uh, instead of kind of get the worm's eye view as we, as we move along verse by verse, word by word in that section of Revelation, pull back, pull up, and get the bird's eye view and look at the whole book of Revelation. It can be grasped and understood. It was a number of years ago now that I, I felt that the congregation of Grace Community Church could benefit by getting an overview of Revelation. So I did what I called a jet tour through Revelation. And in one message, one Sunday night, for an hour and a half at least, I went from the beginning to the end of Revelation and showed how it flows, how cohesive it is, how clear it is, what a together revelation it is. That is now available in a booklet called A Jet Tour Through Revelation. This is one of the longest messages I've ever preached. One sermon, the whole book of Revelation, we put it into a booklet form. Uh, This one book will give you the sense and the flow of the book of Revelation. It's a high-altitude panoramic view of the whole book. What a tremendous ministry this has had through the years through our ministry. We'd love to get one to you. Here's the good news. It's free. That's right. We'll send you free of charge a jet tour through the whole book of Revelation. All you have to do is contact us. Tell us you want a free copy of a jet tour through Revelation. We'll get it out to you as quickly as we can. Now, friend, there's no need to feel intimidated by Revelation or assume that it's just impossible to understand. John's booklet can show you what the last book of the Bible is all about. To get your copy of A Jet Tour Through Revelation, contact us today. Mail your request to Grace to You, Post Office Box 4000, Panorama City, California, 91412. You can also let us know that you'd like a free copy of the booklet, A Jet Tour Through Revelation, by sending us an email to letters at gty.org or by calling our customer service line, 1-800-55-GRACE. That number translates to 800-554-7223. Now again, we'll send you a free copy, but if you'd like to order extra copies to give to friends and loved ones, maybe a small group at church, that booklet, A Jet Tour Through Revelation, costs $2. Shipping is free. To order it, call 1-800-55-GRACE or visit our website, gty.org. By the way, while you're online, make sure you take advantage of the thousands of free resources there, including the Grace to You blog, daily devotionals, and more than 3,000 of John's sermons, free to download in the MP3 or transcript format. That website again, gty.org. And now for John MacArthur and the entire staff, I'm your host, Carl Miller. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, Please come back at the same time tomorrow for another half hour of Unleashing God's Truth one verse at a time on Grace to You. They say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but what cure is there if you're not prepared for the Lord's return? John MacArthur considers the question on tomorrow's Grace to You. You don't get to decide how you were raised, what you were born into, any of that. Those decisions were made for you. But you get to decide from this point on. What time is it right now? What time is it right now? What time is it right now? 10, 28, 
Eastern Time, August what? 22nd, 2021, the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, from this moment forward, or whenever you're watching this, from this moment forward, you get to decide who do I want to be discipled by. In the scripture, you have the Pharisees who have been discipled by generation after generation of scribes and teachers of the law. And the law was good. God gave the law. It was a gift from God. God gave them the, the Sabbath as a gift to reflect and remember. One little known thing about the Sabbath is that God said one time, I gave you this as a gift to remember when you were slaves in Egypt and I brought you out. Isn't it crazy that a gift God gave them to remember how they were set free from their slavery, they have now become slaves of the Sabbath? Mark says it real clear. He says that Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But by the time that Jesus is walking the earth and touching and healing and teaching with power, and preaching the kingdom of God and inaugurating a new order of things. By the time the, the true king has come, they have turned the gift that God gave into a prison. Anything can become a prison. Right now, technology is enabling me to preach this word to somebody who couldn't hear it any other way. And I praise God for the gift of technology. On the other hand, I curse the day that our phones ever got smart. And I don't have the faith yet, but I bought a flip phone two years ago. And when I get enough faith, I'm going to hook it up and I'm going to be the only person care they're going to call me flip phone furtick. And yeah, if you want to talk to me, you're going to have I don't have the faith yet. I'm not there yet cuz I'm tethered to this right now, but I'm praying for the day where I could have enough faith to be set free from the curse of this. But it's a gift. Welcome our EFAM around the world. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get saved off of this message, and I'm trying to cast the devil out of your YouTube feed and your algorithm. The same feed that is making you crazy is putting the word of God in your spirit right now. But the same gift that helps me preach the gospel can become a prison. It can put you on so many stupid headlines and half truths and and 10% truths and 2% truths and conspiracy theories and and all all of that is all of that is contained in the same gift. Same thing with money. Same thing same thing with money. God can can bless you with income. But then that income can cause you to step out a little too far, a little too fast. Now, all of a sudden, you are imprisoned in something that you prayed for and God gave you because you didn't know how to manage it. I think I ought to teach you about this, that a gift can become a prison. Intimacy is a gift from God. All kinds of intimacy, not just sexual intimacy, but sexual intimacy is a gift from God. But you understand how when we talk about the Sabbath, a gift that God gave that became twisted to imprison so that the Pharisees are saying, you're not allowed to eat on the Sabbath. They have become locked into the law and missed the spirit of the very gift that God gave. And That happens all the time in our life, so that an Olympic athlete can say, you know, this talent that was given to me by God that was such a good thing, it almost broke me, so that someone who starts to be blessed financially, they can say, you know what? When I started getting more money, I stopped trusting God as much. I had a man tell me one time, I started thinking money was the answer to everything. I started just skipping God in the process when I didn't need to ask him anymore, and I basically designed a life for myself that made God unnecessary. So he thought, because the gift became a prison. I could give you more examples, but I think you've got your own. Things that God gave you that you became a slave to. Things that God, I'm not talking about the devil. I'm talking about a gift. The Sabbath didn't come from the devil. 
It came from God. It's in the book of Genesis. It's God that gave them that rest. But they turned the gift of rest into a weapon. They turned the gift of God into a prison. In fact, just a few verses later, they go from picking on the disciples about eating grain in a field on the Sabbath to telling Jesus he can't heal a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. You mean to tell me that Jesus can't give this man his ability to work on this day because you've set it aside as a day not to work? But see how this happens in our lives so subtly that a gift that God gives you can become twisted to the point that the gift that was given to serve you begins to enslave you. And I think what's happening in this passage is really demonstrated in what the disciples did that we have to do all the time. It says that, <laughs> verse 1, they took the heads of grain. And when they would rub them in their hands, they would then eat the kernels. All right, so what's wrong with this? What's so, what's so bad about it? Are they stealing in someone else's field? No, because the Levitical law says that the edges of the field are to be left unharvested so the traveler passing through can eat from it, so they're not breaking any laws. But see, the Pharisees, they had 39 laws or 39 categories of things you couldn't do on the Sabbath that God never said you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Now, here's what's going to trip you out, and this is how weird religion can get. You're allowed to pluck grain on the Sabbath, but you just can't harvest grain on the Sabbath by the Pharisees' rule. Not God's rule, by the Pharisees' rule. So how close do the Pharisees have to be watching the disciples? Like, who's the sick one here if you are stalking me to the point that you are watching me rub the heads of grain between my hands? I think you are the one who has a problem and needs counseling, not me because I'm hungry. Yes, I'm talking about the comment section. I have never, ever in my life seen more crazy than in the comment section of a Christian YouTube channel. Because here I am now watching everything. Ah, they're not supposed to do this now. It would have been fine if they would have plucked it. But when they rub the grain to get the husks to fall away, now you know what the husk is. The husk is the worthless part that protects the kernels. Other gifts that are packaged, right? And it can take his seat and shine. Oscar doesn't have to be intimidated by me. He can worship like he worships. Jamar can play like he plays. All the drummers can beat like they beat because all of them know who they are. And when you package right, you can sit amongst the gifted and we all things can work together for the good of them that love the Lord who are the called according to his purpose. My God, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. This is your time. This is your season. This is your moment. This is your second. Jump on your feet and holler, I'm gifted! Hey, I've got more to share with you. And I know some of you are saying to yourself, I'm too old, I'm too late, I'm, I'm too deeply entrenched in my circumstance to activate. No, 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 no. Caleb did it when he was an old man. Abraham was still discovering himself up until his senior years. You are never too late to correct your navigation and move into your purpose and destiny. I'll be back for more in just a moment. Discover the freedom of who you're meant to be. Greatness lies within following your instinct. If you've got the instinct, if you've got the inclination, how do you expect somebody to value it enough, to invest in it enough, to get behind it enough if you won't expose what you got? You gotta believe in what he put down inside of you. That's in that man sitting next to you. That's in that woman right behind you. That's in your sister to the left. You may not see my lips moving, but my soul is saying, there's a lion roaring in me. Order Instinct today on CD or DVD when you call or visit tdjakes.org. Defeat is not enough. The fight is on. 
The year's most highly anticipated event is here. The wait is over. We're about to rock it out. Woman Thou Art Loose 2014. With speakers, Bishop T.D. Jakes, Mrs. Sarita Jakes, Christine Kane, Dr. Jasmine Scullark, Dr. Claudette Copeland, Sarah Jakes, Pastor Van Moody. This is going to be epic. The wait is over. Woman Thou Art Loose 2014 in Atlanta, Georgia, October 2nd through 4th. Register today. As I close today, I just want to thank God for all of the pastors and uh, all of our leaders, our Bishop's Circle, our Aaron's Army. I want to make sure that you have this material, if you have not gotten it already, to flow in the realm that God is taking us. You need to take a look at what he has placed inside of you and move your life into the places where you best can serve out. Uh, your purpose and destiny without wondering. I'm clapping my hands and praising the Lord and I'm glad I'm saved, but I wonder what I'm supposed to do beyond church and Bible class and singing in the choir. God has so much for you. I want to be sure you get it. This is the Potter's Touch. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin to look. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Have you ever watched The Exorcist and wondered, are demons real? Well, we interviewed a leading exorcist to find out, and the truth was shocking. Tell me who you are. The one you won't get out. The one you can't. Levitations, vomiting, spitting at the priest with an uncanny marksmanship. That has not been a movie for me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know Lance Bass is a Russian-trained astronaut? That he went through training in a secret facility outside Moscow, hoping to become the youngest person to go to space? Well, I ought to know, because I'm Lance Bass. And I'm hosting a new podcast that tells my crazy story and an even crazier story about a Russian astronaut who found himself stuck in space with no country to bring him down. With the Soviet Union collapsing around him, he orbited the Earth for 313 days that changed the world. Listen to The Last Soviet on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, guys, this question is from steveharveyfm.com, and it's from Pamela in Virginia. She needs some advice. Pamela says, hi, Stephen family. I'm 42, and I've been married for six years. My husband and I survived being quarantined together, but he got on my last nerve, wanting to watch all of my shows and commenting on them. Now he's hooked on reality TV and can't wait to watch all of my shows. If my girlfriends call, he's all in my conversation. If we're talking about TV, I need him to get a life. I wish he liked sports or enjoyed hanging with his friends he loves hanging with me 24 7 how do i tell him to get a life and get away from me well let me say this if he watching ready to love i can't be mad at him you understand what i'm saying I cannot. <laughs> right, right. If, if he watching ready to love baby then i understand he wants to sit there and watch it with you mm-hmm. but on the serious tip if you got a man that 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 y'all don't he don't have nothing to do all he want to do is be around you that's gonna be an issue man, i i love my wife to death but we need our separation. We got to we gotta be, I got to be able to go over here, come back. When I come back, I'm glad to see her. So he needs to find him some stuff to do. You need to get you some golf clubs in your hand. You need to find you a hobby. You need to get this brother a hobby. Won't you turn him on to something that has that he can do alone or with his boy? Now, now just keep in mind, though, when you turn him on to something and he start doing that, keep in mind, now your time is not is he, he's not gonna be focused on you the way he was. I just want yeah. you to know you're playing with something that you might not want to play with. What you're saying is be careful what you wish for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. I miss my man. So be careful what you're asking for. But I understand you want that space. I get it. Mm-hmm. You want that yeah. space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't see nothing wrong with this myself because I am him. 
<laughs> you're you're him, up, Junior. You up on the hook? So you comment on the reality oh, TV oh, shows? Oh, my wife got me hooked on all of this. Uh, mm. uh, family or fiance? <laughs> Ready to love, married at first sight. I'm watching all these shows. I'm in it. I understand. Ooh. And she get on the phone. We start talking about it. She put on speakerphone. I said, "Can you believe, Charles? I'm there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm I in love there, it, Junior. I'm in there, Carla. <laughs> now let Family me tell you, fiance. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Okay, so Junior, what's your favorite reality uh, housewives franchise? Which one are you oh, into? Oh, oh housewives of Atlanta. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. can- Ooh wee. <laughs> but let me tell you something. It ain't the same without Nene. I know that. <laughs> right. I agree. I agree. I agree. I, agree. Ooh, My we, I, 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 I don't understand what she's upset about. We have something to bond about. <laughs> <laughs> I know my wife get tired of that, but she turns it on. It's hard not to if it's on. You 90 Day Fiance? I'm on it. 90 Day Fiance? <laughs> on it. I, I trip out on the one with the... Usman and Kimberly? Hit. Y'all got to see this couple. This is... <laughs> <laughs> They your Ooh, favorite. Y'all got to see this fan couple. favorite Ooh. right there. Oh my Which god. Which one is oh. it that the family decides? If, family or fiance? If, Boy, you got to watch it. Let me tell you something. Uh, you okay. got to get the blessings of the family. Okay. Right. So right. That's the one. Three members from your family and three members from his family. They come down for a weekend. And uh-huh. the issue, they come out. They family gonna tell them, I'm not giving you my blessing. I, they don't like the, they don't like the fiance. They don't like mm-hmm. the, the promise husband. They don't like none of them. And it'd be mm-hmm. good too, girl. Oh my God. <laughs> so you got to see, you got you got to see Kim and Greg. That couple right there, that's my favorite. Uh-huh. I swear God. What is Kim what and she Greg? upset about? Your advice because you you put me on to a uh, little women of Atlanta. Oh, and little I women, never. Uh, uh, oh my God, <laughs> little women. I swear, God, I see all these plugs and plants. You can uh-huh. see all of this on little women. Uh huh. All you, you know see what? is outlets and plants. You see all of that. <laughs> They don't, you'll never see you'll never see a window or nothing on this show. You'll never Outlets see a window. and plants. Plants. You see stuff on the floor. Uh, dog, you got, Boy, to, you you got to watch that. That's just amazing. You never know how much stuff on your floor. I be seeing VCR boxes. I be seeing cable boxes. You see all of this. They be sitting Routers. there talking, leaning on stuff. I hate you. I hate you. Oh, you got to watch that. Uh, what's the, what's, what's, the, what's the one? Now, what's the one in Huntsville? Jim? Oh, oh, love oh, and marriage, Huntsville. Oh, love and marriage, good. Huntsville. That one's oh over my it, though, god, yeah. that boy know how to wear a tight shirt. I know that. That's all I can do. <laughs> Martell. Martell. Martell got tight shirts on lock. <laughs> Go ahead, Martell. Damn them. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up in 20 minutes after the hour, we'll have more of this ignorant show (laughs) right after this. You're listening to the Steve Harvey Morning Show. In 2018, it was reported there was a dramatic rise in the number of cases of demonic possession. For many of the most disturbing cases, Father Carlos Martins was often summoned. I have seen things, very evil things. I order you to go in the name of Christ. I'm not leaving. We've been together too long. He needs me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin to look. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Did you know Lance Bass is a Russian-trained astronaut? That he went through training in a secret facility outside Moscow, hoping to become the youngest person to go to space? Well, I ought to know, because I'm Lance Bass. And I'm hosting a new podcast that tells my crazy story and an even crazy science based. And I, I've just written an op ed actually suggesting that the scientists themselves should become the primary communicator in the public space of their science. Do not surrender that to political actors. The bureaucratic actors, even if they have a science degree, or to media commentators exclusively. Because they, even unintentionally, they have a biased interpretation. They will use the science that supports for their preconceived notions, and they'll ignore the stuff that they don't. Science, but you got to work on that. How do we improve the relations between science and the political community? And then the last thing I get into is, uh, what can you say to faith-oriented people as to how to participate in the political 
arena. And uh, on that, I go back to the New Testament, where the, you know, the historians say that Jesus of Nazareth, the first, he only had three and three and a half years of public work. The first year, he, he had this motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors, shepherds, whatever they were. They, they didn't do anything except follow him around and see, see what he did and see what he said. But about a year in, he decided he's going to send them out to do some public work in his name. But he this whole passage in Matthew, which gives an instruction. And the, the key instruction was, be wise as serpents and gracious as doves, which are powerful analogies in the Jewish uh, lexicon. That wise as, as a serpent. The serpent was the symbol of the devil. To be as wise as the forces of evil. And the dove was the symbol of the Spirit of God, be as gracious as the Spirit of God. And so I, I say if you're a believer, and this doesn't just apply to Christians, if you're a faith-oriented person participating in democratic politics, be wise in how you do it and be gracious. And I always ask, he did not say be vicious as snakes and stupid as pigeons, which some of us of a faith background are, are capable of doing. So these are all recruitment, uh, training, uh, special training for on the science side, the religious side. These are all things that could be done to, I think, to strengthen democracy. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the last uh, um, detour that 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 the conversation took. That, and you've done a fair bit of work on navigating the faith political interface. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, I think people of faith has have major things they can contribute. Uh, one is in this area of lawmaking. Uh, if, if one wants to read a treatise on the attempt to achieve uh, conflict resolution and uh, peace and prosperity through the rule of law, you cannot read a more thorough book than the, the, than the Hebrew scriptures, the, the Christian Old Testament. Because what was that all about? It, 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 there was a proclamation of the law of God through Moses, the, the Ten Commandments. You, you, get, you have a good illustration description of that in non-religious language in that uh, book, that last book of yours. Uh, and then you have a 400-year experiment of trying to make people righteous by applying the rule of law with drastic penalties uh, proclaimed for breaking it and enormous blessings promised for keeping. But, but what, what was the conclusion of the Latter-day Prophets? That you couldn't make people righteous by law alone unless it could be internalized, unless it was written, as Isaiah said this, or Zechariah or somebody, unless the law can be written on the tablets of the heart, it's no good just having it on tablets of stone or parchment or in statute books or the revised statutes of Canada. Like that, that's an enormous lesson. The benefits of law and the rule of law, it's extreme importance, but it has limits. And that's something that people of faith, particularly Christians or, or Jewish people that understand that, that's an enormous contribution you can make. And, and particularly in these parliaments and legislations today, where you've got people that think you can solve every problem by some action of government, or some law of government, that that would be a, a contribution that they could make. And then, the law has to reflect the spirit of the people that it serves. Otherwise, it would be just an imposition from outside, right? So it has to be part of this conversation that, that we've been talking about continually. Yeah. And, and then, then if you go to the New, New Testament, okay, okay, so you can't reconcile people that God to each other by the rule of law alone. So what do you got? The New Testament, you've got a different approach, self-sacrificial mediation. A mediator, for one thing, who incorporates both sides of the problem. And the vertical of God and his man. Uh, he, he, this is the very opposite of a judicial mediator who is distant, who, who has to keep himself distant from the parties. No, this mediator integrates both of them. He's on both sides. So, so how do you understand that, uh, both religiously and politically? Well, well, I can give you a, a sort of a humorous example of more from my consulting practice. What, what, one, of, one of the things that um, I, I got involved in trying to reconcile some conflict between oil companies and Aboriginal people. <laughs> Gulf oil had a, a heavy oil, this is a long time ago, so my, my details may be not <laughs> as correct as they should be, but they had a heavy oil pilot plant at Wabascon, north of Lesser Slave Lakes, south and east of Fairview, where you <laughs> came from. 
and there was a big Aboriginal band, there was a big stone band, and there was going to be tensions between the oil company and the Aboriginals. And so the, the guy in charge of the project, his name was Norm, he was a principal guy who I really admired, except he used to swear all the time that his favorite epithet was Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I could even that bothered me. But anyway, one day Norm says, we got to fire, we got to hire somebody to help deal with this potential coming conflict between us and the Big Stone Band. Uh, and he said, I want suggestions from all of you. I was a consultant and there was others there. And so a few weeks later, he said, well, I, I've got the suggestions back. The, the legal people want a legal beagle because, because they, they say this is going to get into court and they want somebody that can handle the legal aspects of the treaty relationship and the contract with the band and everything else. They want a legal beagle. He says the PR people want a pretty face that can explain all this on television and smooth it all over. And he says, a manning here, because I've recommended a Meiji guy that I knew in the community who hunted and fished with the big stone boys, and, but who'd also done contract work and was well respected by golf. I recommended a, a, an in-between guy who incorporated both sides of the question. And so Norm says, a manning here wants me to hire Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then he says, okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to take all the candidates down to the Athabasca River, the first one that could walk across the top. <laughs> but, but, you know, that, but he, Norm knew what I was getting at. You, you, yes, you can get a defender on one side or the other from a PR standpoint or legal standpoint. Or you can try to find a mediator who actually internalizes this conflict. And I think that person can play that reconciliation role better than the person from one side or the other. That's maybe not the best illustration. What, and what do you mean by internalizing the conflict? Well, in, in effect, the, the example of Jesus of Nazareth, like he, he, he took upon himself the sins of the people and sacrificed himself in order to satisfy the demands of the other party. And, and I think in this third party uh, reconciliation, maybe maybe the, by a mediator, and, and the difficulty in it is that the mediator... Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. It is day 363, not another palindrome day, maybe our final palindrome day of the year. We're reading Revelations chapter 15, 16, and 17, as well as Hebrews chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. <laughs> Just piece of cake. It's going to be super short. We're also reading Proverbs chapter chapter 31, verses 23 through 25. As always, the Bible translation I'm reading from is the Revised Standard Version, 2nd Catholic Edition. I'm using the Great Adventure Bible from Ascension. If you want to download your own Bible in a Year reading plan, you can visit ascensionpress.com slash Bible in a Year. You can also subscribe to this podcast because why stop saying it now? <laughs> it is day 363. We're reading Revelation, not Revelations. Why did I say it? Revelations. It's not plural. It's singular, although it's pretty great. Revelation, chapter 15, 16, and 17. Hebrews, Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, as well as Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 23 to 25. The Revelation to John, chapter 15. The Angels with the Seven Last Plagues. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and wonderful, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and wonderful are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the ages. Who shall not fear and glorify your name, O Lord? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship you, for your judgments have been revealed. After this I looked. And the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen, and with golden sashes across their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. Chapter 16 the bowls of God's wrath. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go, and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, 
and foul and evil sores came upon the men who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a dead man, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of water say, Just are you in these your judgments, you who are and were, O holy one. For men have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is their due. And I heard the altar cry, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was in darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores and did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw, issuing from the mouth of the dragon and from the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet, three foul spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits, performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is he who is awake, keeping his garments, that he may not go naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and a great voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as had never been since men were on the earth, so great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered great Babylon to make her drain the cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, heavy as a hundredweight, dropped on men from heaven, till men cursed God for the plague of the hail, so fearful was that plague. Chapter 17. The Great Whore and the Beast. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman, drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to behold the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to perdition. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and give over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And He said to me, The waters that you saw where the harlot is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and giving over their royal power to the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth. The Letter to the Hebrews, Chapter 5 
For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is bound to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not take the honor upon himself, but he is called by God, just as Aaron was. Hi, thanks for listening to the Tony Robbins podcast. This is just a quick note about this episode in case you'd rather watch and see the video of this conversation, which includes behind the scenes footage with Tony, Sage, and me, Mary B. And that's found at youtube.com backslash Tony Robbins Live. If you'd like to listen, you're in the right place. Hello there, everyone. It is an absolute privilege and an honor for us to be featuring Tony Robbins on the Tony Robbins podcast. <laughs> Thanks for the invite, ladies. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> Well, today's session, I'm joining for the very beginning again. These two ladies are going to take you on the journey. But, you know, it's February and Valentine's Day is coming up right around the time we're filming this or shooting this, I should say. And, you know, there's chocolates everywhere and the, the idea of romance being promoted. And a lot of it, it feels false and saccharine, you know, just artificial. It's not authentic. I think a lot of people are really jaded about what love is because they've had love and now they associate pain to love. Mm. And it's not pain, that the love is not the pain, it's the yeah. loss of love that people fear. And so I thought maybe we could have a little conversation here with me in the beginning and then you guys can take over about what really is love and it's incredibly powerful force to shape us because there's nothing on earth more powerful. Nothing will take someone to their knees quicker, I don't care the strongest warrior on earth, man or woman, than the loss of love. Yeah. Nothing lifts you higher than love. When when you're totally in love, what's wrong with life? Nothing. You know, you don't need money, you don't need background, but you'll figure that stuff out because <laughs> love is that fuel. And I think it's so important that for people to think about that it is how we're wired. Babies that aren't physically loved, that aren't held, that don't have kinesthetic love, develop something called failure to thrive syndrome and they can die. Love is our evolutionary advantage. Mm. You know, many species are born and you know, the baby is, the parents aren't there. You know, it's an egg that hatches. And so the evolutionary advantage is they've got horns or they got teeth or they got camouflage. But if a human baby's left alone in the forest, no one's there, it's gonna die. Our evolutionary advantage is that we fall in love, which means we will put someone else's needs ahead of our own. And I think that's critical. And that doesn't have to just be intimate love, you know, in the form of physical intimacy. It can be the love of chosen family. It can certainly mm -hmm. be the love of family. And we've certainly experienced a whole explosion of that with this modern family we have here and with our, our daughter who's just shy of two years two mm -hmm. years old now. It's been an explosion of love, wouldn't you say? It certainly has been. An ex You're an explosion of love. <laughs> <laughs> you are such a lover to all. You know, for those of you who've maybe ever had proximity or went to an event or attended one of our programs, uh, you know, what people always say is that if there's 10,000 people, I felt like Tony was speaking directly to me. And they might be like way at the back of the stadium. And that's love. Love yeah. penetrates or, or permeates is more accurately space and time. And it's that intimacy of, of one offering their heart. And you do that so generously, so abundantly, Tone. I mean, oh, every so day, day. And now it is who you are. It flows out of you. Uh, you're such a, a, a beautiful vessel of love in, in a form that's unexpected. You know, a lot of people look at you this big you know, this big physical stature and not know actually the, the real tenderness and sincerity um, that expresses as, as your isness of who you are as well. Well, my, my mission is to have the people feel loved and cared for. Sometimes love is too strong, they don't believe it, but when you're up there sweating for 12 straight <laughs> hours, the third day in, people get converted and they start going, this guy really means it. Um, but, you know, I just, this, we just got back from the JP Morgan uh, conference and what I was really touched by in that environment was uh, Jamie Dimon, who's the, you know, the CEO of th that bank, JP Morgan. Uh, the end of his whole talk and the, the, the thing that permeated the room mm. was this feeling of kindness and love. Mm. That that's the missing ingredient in our world. And to even have uh, the bankers say that, and then, you know, of course, Mary Callan Erdo, some of you read my books on finance, and she's probably one of the most influential women in all of finance, manages, I don't know, four or five trillion dollars now in business. And you, you just see she created an environment where everybody felt nurtured, cared for, loved, looked out for. But the most successful leaders that I know 
are heart-driven leaders. I mean, mm-hmm. what makes you a leader is you care about something more than yourself. You care about something, whether it's your family, your kids, or your community. There's something you love. That's where energy comes from. That's what changes life. So I just, I hope that we all know what love is. We all know we can't live without it. Uh, but we've all had disappointments and pain. And I hope that those out there will reconsider that love could be something you could open yourself to in the first steps of just kindness and just caring mm-hmm. and just warmth and, and love that's outside an intimate relationship. And if you can find that outside the relationship, it can also lead to the intimacy that so many people are craving. I know I've mentioned this before, but it always strikes me how, you know, even men in your life that are dear friends and uh, just how they're moved by the expression of how you care for them, how you love them. It's very demonstrative. Uh, that happens on stage. That happens at home. Uh, you are that. Uh, you are that. And, you well, so know, we... are you, my sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so is Mary well, B. Here. Takes That's one fine. to no one. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely takes one to no one. That's been 24 years since I hooked up with you, my weirdo. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is the weirdest human I love, I love, by the way. She's the most... I know, weird wasn't on my list, but it's one of the great gifts. But the weirdness is touched with humor and love. Everything you do is love. You're the love to so many people. You love this whole family. You're the love to all the people in our companies. I mean, you just, you exude it in every way, sweetheart. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm so excited that you guys have kind of commandeered the podcast here <laughs> because so few people get to know what I get to know, which is you and Mary together is just the love that you are and what all the gifts you guys have to share, the insights you have to share. And so I'm, I'm great to drop into the Tony Robbins podcast with you. <laughs> but what I love is what comes out between the two of you, because unless people are part of our platinum partnership and things like that, yes. where they all get to know you very well and you teach with me, a lot of people don't get to see that. So it's true. I'm grateful that people get your perspective. I, I want to hear your perspective on what is love and what drives love from your perspective. You know, coming into this conversation, Mary and I were talking and I was saying that I really look at love as an inside out experience. And I think that sometimes that's not that it can't come external in as well. It flows both ways. Like all of life, there's an ebb and flow like an ocean. But I think sometimes it's imbalanced in our society of the expectation that love would be coming from the outside uh, rather than. I am a love. I am love. You know, I don't mean I, me. I mean, we are born as love. I think that is the most clear takeaway, uh, being parents at this stage and watching our daughter and watching this essence just flow out of her as her. There's no doing in that. There's no thought in that. It is, it is, it emanates, it resonates and, uh, love that essence and watching her, uh, just shine. I think is so extraordinary and reminds me of the fact that it it is inside of us. It's in every one of us. It's our nature when we get out of our own human way or we, you know, drop the conditionings or the impressions that uh, wired us in, in a way that, um, you know, innocently makes us expect that I want you know, yeah. I want love. And if you love me, you know, you'll do this. It's, it's, we innocently can put all these demands on love, which of course, you know, uh, creates a restriction and, and, and doesn't allow love to flow. Yeah. And so I started quoting the early church fathers right back at them and started challenging them on what they thought was their own ground. Well, historically, it hasn't been their own ground. Anybody who's read Salmon or Whitaker. Um, any of those, uh, even if you're in the Lutheran realm, Chemnitz, so on and so forth, knows that's that that's not been the case. There's always been a very lively, well, if you read Calvin, always been a very lively interest in patristic sources and citations thereof and so on and so forth. So, uh, the, the, the fact is that even when we start going into church history, how many times do you hear Jerry Mattox? Uh, say, well, that was just that person's personal interpretation. When I would quote something that would be against the Roman position, well, you know, that that was just his personal view. Well, what's the difference between when an early church father says something that supports modern Roman theology or when someone says something that opposes modern Roman theology? Well, it's whatever the church says. And I remember back when John Paul II was Pope, uh, he had said something that was in direct contradiction uh, to one of the uh, ecumenical councils, major ecumenical councils, and I pointed this out. And Robertson Genis, who at that time was much more mainstream than than he is anymore, uh, had basically said, well, well, James, the the, the church gets to 
uh, interpret its own history. And so it's, it's like today. Um, Rome has developed the very same type of progressive interpretation of its own history that quote-unquote progressives, I call them regressives, or more properly communists, um, in our land today, uh, where the, the Constitution becomes a living document. What it was intended to say, the grammar, the words, the context, even the commentary of the Founding Fathers themselves, that's irrelevant. It's now a living document that we can change all of that into whatever we want it to be. Well, that's pretty much what Rome has said about her own history and her own writings. We don't get to interpret them. We, we can. We can go back to what those councils said. We can go back to Trent, for example. All sorts of commentaries were written in the decades after Trent. Catechisms, so on and so forth. There really isn't much of a question as to what was meant in, in so the vast majority of the documents. And, but that's irrelevant because, you see, it's a living church. And so, uh, as it's a living church, uh, then it's interpreted by the living magisterium. And so, if a pope in the past says it is absolutely necessary for salvation to be subject to the Roman pontiff, we know what he meant by that. We know what that meant in his context. We know what that communicated to the people around him. But that is now irrelevant because we live in the modern age. And, I, and no one, no one can look you and stare you honestly in the eye and say, I am absolutely certain that Innocent III believed exactly what Francis believes as the Bishop of Rome. Right, uh-huh. And I've got some swampland out in Ajo, Arizona I'd like to sell you, too. Uh, just, you, you know it's the case. You know that's the way it is. So, I, now, if Alan Rule... If it's actually bishop or cardinal rule, um, then okay, uh, that would give a little bit more weight to this. But as far as I know, it's layman rule. It's not father. It's not bishop. Doesn't speak for the church. It's his own personal opinions. Um, and that's going to become important because he gets to interpret things his way. And the professors, priests, bishops... At Boston College and other places, they interpret things their way. And how are we poor, benighted Protestants supposed to figure this stuff out? I mean, man, I mean, in my own lifetime. Uh, John Paul II, Ratzinger, Francis. They seem to have really different views on things. Really different takes, different spins. Uh, how am I supposed to know the living voice? And blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's remember uh, Father Michael Mueller in The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, page 131. He delivered his body and blood to his apostles, whom he then appointed the priests of the New Testament. And to them and to their successors in the priesthood, he gave a command to offer by these words, do this for commemoration of me, Luke twenty two nineteen. So the Catholic Church has always understood and taught, end quote. That is a lie. That is a documentable, recognized lie. It's a, it's a lie of piety, um, but it's untrue. But that's what's been taught within one realm of Roman Catholic piety and belief. I have a feeling that Rule would accept that with maybe some caveats because he wouldn't want to have to defend that because he knows he can't. But there's the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Richard Hansen, the Christian Priesthood Examined, Letterworth Press, 1979, page 31. Does the New Testament recognize any individual minister as a Christian priest in virtue of his being a minister? The reader will not be surprised to find that this question must receive an ans as an answer an emphatic negative. Next page. There is no mention of Christian priests. Uh, I'm sorry. There is no mention of Christian officials as priests in the New Testament, whatever. We have no ground for assuming that the large number of priests of the Jewish temple who, we are told, became Christians, officiated as or were regarded as priests in a specifically Christian sense. Despairing attempts have been made to read the existence of Christian priests in the various parts of the New Testament. There is no other part of the New Testament where a mention of Christian official priests is even remotely likely. But of official Christian priests, we must honestly admit there is in the New Testament not the faintest whisper. Not the faintest 
whisper. Later on, he says, no Christian priesthood is found in the New Testament. There is, in fact, no solid evidence that anyone thinks of, of Christian ministers as priests until about the year 200. Attempts have been made to find evidence for a Christian priesthood in the second century. If some passages can plausibly be dressed up to appear like evidence for a Christian priesthood in the second century, then it might be possible to interpret passages in the New Testament which are not apparently favorable to this interpretation as in reality favoring it, and so the blessed haven of an apostolic or dominical institution for the priesthood might be reached. Likely candidates for the position of priests in the second century should be presbyters or bishops, but nobody called these priests at that time, page 36. Also in page 36, after discussing one appearance of priest in Ignatius, there can be no basis for a Christian priesthood in the second century here. After discussing Clement, those of you following the church history series that I'm teaching right now, we've just done Clement and Ignatius did the martyrdom of Polycarp this past Sunday morning. After discussing Clement, he only knows of two ministers in the Christian church, that of Episcopos, Presbyter, Bishop and Presbyter being regarded as identical as in Acts 20:28, 20, Hermas, the Didache, and the pastoral Paqua on this very issue. He admitted that from their perspective, priest developed out of the term presbyter. The problem is presbyter, presbyteros, 